Thanks, Ruth. So, so, you know, venous disease is an example of how nimble or special it can be. I mean, if you look at, for example, varicose veins used to just be stripping. That's all you had to offer, and you didn't really do much. Um, but the diagnosis is made in the vascular lab. The diagnosis of DVT and the diagnosis of reflux are made in the vascular lab. That's why it's important that you focus on the vascular lab and you have that as part of your practice. Because again, who, he who makes the diagnosis controls the flow direction of the patient. And so it used to be a pain in the neck. You made a diagnosis of DVT. Well, all you had to do was really put them on anticoagulation. Well, no, not really, because now what you're seeing is the evolution more and more and more of interventional therapy. And then it used to be they had a PE and you got anticoagulation. And now you, this the evolution of interventional uh, pulmonary thrombectomy, if you want to put it that way. And so this is one of the reasons that you want to stay engaged with these things, even if up front it may, it may not look like there are procedures that are associated with it. So... Stay tuned. And Linda's going to tell us a little bit about um, the intervention and treatment basically that's available for PE, management of PE. <clears throat> okay. All right, so I'm just going to talk uh, 15 minutes about PE, which could be a whole day's worth of um, discussion. So why do we worry about um, PE and DVT? Well, PE is the most preventable cause of an in-hospital death, and it accounts for 5 to 10 percent of deaths in the hospital. And the ones that do survive, 10 percent of them will die within three months. And um, most of the PEs are actually in non-surgical patients. Thank goodness. Um, so what's the path of uh, physiolog uh, f physiology of PE? Um, so PE causes, uh, you know, increased RV wall tension, which then causes um, possible ischemia and infarction, um, decreases your coronary perfusion, causes RV dysfunction, um, decreases LV preload, and then that makes them hemodynamically unstable. And so <clears throat> a life-threatening acute PE is when you have a combo of the large clot burden plus underlying cardiopulmonary status, and those two together produce a very unstable patient. Um, the different uh, subtypes are massive, submassive, and minor. Um, so massive only accounts for 5%. Minor is the most, uh, the largest percentage. And then submassive, which is the sort of middle area, which is controversial on how you treat these patients, um, and that's defined as the abnormal, abnormal RV function on some sort of imaging, um, but without hemodynamic instability. So does anybody know how to treat minor, so PE without RV strain and... Yeah, yeah, and actually, and I'm, I'm not talking much about that today in this talk, but any coagulation, and actually more evidence now on actually ambulatory, so letting them go home dis or discharging them very early from the hospital. Okay, so clinical findings in terms of um, massive and submassive. So you'll see RV dysfunction um, on echo um, and elevated troponins, BMP, and an increased RV-LV ratio. You know, before I actually came here as an attending, we never did PE lysis or did any of this. This was all medicine and interventional radiology where I trained. So um, here, I've learned a lot in the last two years. So just to let you know, your first year out of um, fellowship is the highest learning curve curve you'll ever have. Um, but so increased RV-LV ratio, which you can look at on echo or CT. Obviously, we're much better at looking at CT scans than echoes. Um, so you look at the RV size and the LV, and if it's greater than 0.9, that's an indicator of mortality. And then increased PA pressures. Um, so the uh, American... Um, College of Chest Physicians put out a PE uh, severity index. So if you have any of these um, factors or parameters, um, you're at an increased risk for PE-related mortality. Um, so you're older, elderly, cancer, um, you're tachycardic, blood pressure's low. And if you have one or more parameters, that increases your 30-day mortality to 8.9%. So what are your goals of treatment as part of a multidisciplinary team? You want to prevent mortality, prevent recurrent PE, prevent late onset chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and also improve their quality of life in the future. 
Uh, this is a treatment algorithm uh, figure from a, a great review from JBS um, 2015 about uh, treatment of PE, and it just sort of goes through the algor algorithm of how you would treat um, PE. So again, we talked about the low-risk PE, heparin anticoagulation, um, massive PE, that's with hypotension and hemodynamic instability. Um, if there's contraindication to thrombolysis, then you would um, potentially do a open um, or a low dose protocol of systemic thrombolysis or a catheter based intervention. Um, and then if it's again submassive PE, a multidisciplinary team decision on what to do about those patients. Um, so the treatment guidelines from um, CHEST, the 10th edition, so for massive pulmonary embolism, um, their recommendation is for IV thrombolytics, which is 100 milligrams TPA over two hours, that's IV. Um, Catheter-directed thrombolysis only when the patient is at high risk of bleeding or there's no improvement with the systemic uh, thrombolytics or open embolectomy if there's um, absolute contraindication to any lysis. And then for submassive PE, again, anticoagulation and um, recommend consideration of catheter-directed um, therapies. Now, again, for the massive, they, you stop the heparin when you're giving the uh, systemic TPA. Okay, so more about submassive P. So why do we care about this subtype? Um, because if they have continued um, RV dysfunction at discharge, they are eight times more likely to have a recurrent episode. They are four times more likely to die as compared to patients that have um, improved RV function at discharge. And at one year, almost half of them will have chronic pulmonary hypertension symptoms. Um, and again, this, this RV dysfunction definitely increases your mortality rate. Um, so systemic thrombolysis, that's the 100 milligrams TPA over two hours. It has proven to decrease mortality and lower your incidence of recurrent PE. However, it increases your bleeding complications by a lot. So intracranial hemorrhage, 0 to 3%, and major bleeding complications up to 21.7%. And even the patients who have been screened without any uh, contraindications to lysis, um, they, you can still have a high rate of major hemorrhage. So, and then the quick contraindications for lysis, this is all in Rutherford, which you, you should definitely know. Um, so what are the areas of uncertainty in this topic? So many, many areas of uncertain, uncertainty, actually. So lack of controlled, um, randomized controlled trials on whether systemic versus catheter-directed, which one is better for both um, subcategories of massive versus submassive, whether low-dose systemic lysis is comparable to catheter-directed. So low-dose systemic would be half of 100 milligrams, so 50 milligrams TPA over two hours. And there have been studies looking at low-dose versus high-dose, um, which it seems that you know low-dose is as therapeutic with fewer bleeding complications. And who are the patients that are appropriate for catheter-directed therapies, risk stratifications, um, and what are the long-term outcomes after we do these procedures? And despite all of this, you know, how CD, catheter-directed therapies has become more popular and is often line at some hospitals the first-line treatment um, just due to the smaller um, amount of TPA you have to use and the fewer bleeding complications. Um, different catheter-directed therapies, traditionally this has been the cheapest one, thrombus, fragmentation. I've never actually done this. I don't know if Dr. Lumsden or anybody wants to comment, but um, it's a rotating pigtail catheter and you're, um, the whole principle is just trying to break up the clot with this pigtail by dragging it. Um, but also with this, um, you can use adjunctive treatment modalities such as aspiration thrombectomy, like uh, this Flowtriever device where you sort of suction the clot out. Uh, Methodist is actually in a trial right now for the new Inari device that also suctions, but these come with very large sheets, like 20 French sheets. Um, and then the traditional approach, which is tr thrombolytics. So two types, there's multi-side hole. So that is just a simple uh, multi-side hole catheter. McNamara versus the Angiodynamics Unifuse, and then the Ecos. Anybody use Ecos at their hospital? Okay, a lot. It's very expensive. 
Okay. So the two trials on ultrasound-assisted lysis is the Seattle 2 trial and the Ultima trial. So the Seattle 2 um, was in 2015, and they compared um, uh, low-dose um, catheter-directed um, uh, lysis for acute massive and submassive PE, um, and all these patients had an RV-LV diameter above 0 0.9, um, and they these those were the doses that they received, so a total TPA dose of only 24 milligrams versus the systemics, which is 100 milligrams. And they found that at 48 hours, there was a decrease in the RV-LV ratio, uh, a decrease in the pulmonary arteriosystolic pressure, um, and that there was no major bleeding risk, so no intracranial hemorrhage. So they found to be a safe um, therapy. The other one is the Ultima trial. This is a randomized controlled trial, multi-center, but only 59 patients. 30 were ECOS and 30, 29 were just anticoagulation, and their results also showed a reduction in RV-LV ratio at 24 hours with no increased um, difference in bleeding risk. Um, so the question is, is uh, ECOS or ultrasound-assisted better than regular catheter? Um, who knows? This is a retrospective review, actually, from um, the Pittsburgh group that compared um, just regular catheters, so McNamara versus an ECOS, and they really both were um, had similar outcomes, so did improve heart function, but um, both also did not have any uh, major bleeding complications. So, you know, discussion of whether or not ECOS is worth the money. Um, and then in pregnancy patients, how to treat them. So low molecular weight heparin, um, you want to stop 24 hours before labor or C-section and um, extend that treatment six weeks after delivery for patients who are moderate to high risk for um, uh, developing a DVT or PE, maybe consider prophylaxis six weeks after delivery and the new direct thrombin inhibitors are right now not recommended. And then IBC filter, this is like a whole nother discussion and meeting about this, but um, the indication, so uh, for recent proximal DVT or PE, plus an absolute contraindication to full anticoagulation. And what's controversial is to put a uh, filter in somebody who has maybe a big DVT, but, you know, whatever, lung transplant, heart transplant, poor card cardiopulmonary reserve that they, you feel that if one more clot would really put them at risk or a recurrent VT failure um, after anticoagulation treatment or even primary prophylaxis, so trauma patients or bariatric patients before surgery. And a retrospective study in JAMA saw that only 58% of filters were ever removed, thereby all the commercials you see on um, TV about suing. Um, so just an example here of a lysis case. So 58-year-old who developed shortness of breath after a flight, um, and he presented to the ED the next AM. He did have a uh, hypercoagulable disorder, no real surgical history, no recent trauma, head injury, GI bleed, um, morbidly obese, obese. His vital signs, he was slightly tachycardic, some mild distress, um, and no swelling in his lower extremities. And he had a slightly elevated troponin and a CTA, a CTA um, PE protocol showed just um, not a saddle embolus, but emboli in both pulmonary arteries. So how do you go back? Um, so we obtained a duplex, an echo, um, and uh, also measured the RV-LV ratio, which was 1.4. The echo showed mild to moderate depressed rv um, function, and so we obtained all of our data, and then who are you going to call? So here we have a um, dedicated PERT team, so multidisciplinary consisting of vascular surgeons um, and heart failure um, cardiologists, um, as well as cardiac uh, surgeons. So multidisciplinary approach, discuss an individualized treatment for every patient, and we felt that because the uh, guy was fairly young, he worked at a plant um, and was pretty active at his job, that this would be beneficial for him in the long run. Um, and so just some technical considerations. So um, with the catheters, you want to get access in both groins, so seven French sheaths, 
and then in order to cannulate the PA um, using a curved pigtail catheter. And so you just sort of use that alone without a wire to kind of come up through the heart. Um, and then you can shoot your pulmonary angiogram. And then these are the ECOS catheters in place. So one in each groin. Um, oh, okay. And the, um, so afterwards, he did really well. Um, he, he, his ultrasound did show a DVT. We uh, got, got a repeat echo the next day, and his uh, RV dysfunction had improved. Um, and uh, we pulled the catheters. Um, you can do it, pull the catheters at bedside once the echo's done, or you can take them back and shoot another picture. That was meant to be before. I apologize for that, but that shows clot there on the right PA. Hmm. Right here. I want to go It's there. Oh, right there. Right there. <laughs> anyway, now it's all gone and he's perfect. He went home. <laughs> so, in conclusion, um, so RV dysfunction is the main cause of death. That's why you do want to consider um, treating these patients. And even though there aren't any coagulation, that does not clear the existing thrombus, just halts the propagation of that. Um, and it can restore RV function um, and catheter-directed uh, lysis is safe and effective treatment for submassapes to improve RV function as well as to um, improve quality of life in the future. And then having a dedicated per team um, to individualize your treatment for each patient. That's it.